Welcome to the Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you find yourself in this entire world, I welcome you. It's never easy to be prepared or try to be prepared for any kind of death. We don't understand when that day will come. And even when it comes, we're not prepared. Even if it's been a long illness, we're still not prepared. And that's okay. It's just the way it works. And it's hard for us. It's hard for us to accept that. I understand. And with it comes a whole host of emotions. And one of the emotions I'd like to touch on today is stress. Now, we will all have feelings of sadness, guilt, anxiety loneliness, irritability, even overwhelm. Sometimes we have a desire to blame others. We might feel anger, maybe even embarrassment if our loved one might have been murdered or died by suicide. We feel self-doubt, a lower self-esteem, a sense of being out of control. We can experience everything from hopelessness and helplessness to feelings of victimization. It may be many months, even years since their death, and yet there will be times we can't believe it's been that long or short a time since they died. You might be asking yourself, is it really a year already? It feels like it just happened. Yet on other days, we might be thinking, why are these days dragging on so much? I feel like I don't Think of anything else but them, how they died, all that happened leading up to their death. It seems all-consuming. You feel like you can't get a handle on things, like your mind is all over the place, and your heart might be bursting out of your chest. It's even hard to breathe at times. None of us like to experience these feelings these emotions, because they make us feel so uncomfortable, uneasy, uncertain. And you might be thinking to yourself, abstracts are not for me. I want to feel in control. And often, this frustration is one of the worst parts about grief, since you no longer do feel in control. Yet the particular emotion that comes up for most of us is stress. Even if we aren't dealing with the after-effects of a loved one's death, stress is a primary factor in everyday life, and how we handle it has everything to do with how we build a new life after our loved one is no longer with us. Dealing with stress is one of the most important ingredients in successfully moving toward resolution of your grief. Perhaps you've seen family members, friends, or even business colleagues who didn't handle stress very well, 
and found themselves in emergency rooms holding their chest, or worse, encountering major surgery or even death. Stress itself can kill. Your job is to learn how to release stress with the goal toward a saner, more balanced lifestyle. Especially now, with so much inner turmoil wreaking havoc on your body, it is so important that you recognize the need for balance. So let's look at ways to alleviate and reduce stress. It's important to set boundaries. Learning what to say no to and when to say it will help you function in a calm environment, even when chaos may be breaking loose around you. Set boundaries, especially now. This is not the time to let non-bereaved folks walk all over you with talk about their wants and needs. You cannot give everyone the time, help, or energy they want from you at this point. You need more time and energy for yourself to grieve and just have time alone to process all that's happened. Schedule time for yourself. Whether you are living alone or have a group of children or other family members dependent on you, it's really imperative that you faithfully carve out time each week only for yourself. That might be a weekend morning or an evening during the week, but it must be for you only, and if possible, outside to meet with friends. Visit a beautiful park with a book or your journal, the ocean a lake, or other scenic place where you are in nature. If possible, let the sun shine on your face, feel the breeze, even let the light rain that's falling to fall on you for a short time. So much is going on in your life, and you need these little forms of escape. Where can you go, and what can you do to schedule time for yourself? Write them in your gratitude journal. Next, I'd like to talk about prayer and meditation. Even if you don't consider yourself religious or spiritual, my sense of this is that there is someone much higher than ourselves. And if you listen to other episodes, you know that I feel strongly that heaven is real from all the people I've spoken with over the years who have died and came back to tell about it. Being still in our room when we first rise in the morning gives us a peaceful start to our day. We acknowledge that there is someone who has more power than we do. We may not know all the answers to what has happened, but knowing we aren't in this alone certainly helps us. I personally say thank you every morning and evening for what I do have and what I've accomplished in that day. I thank God for all he is orchestrating on my behalf in the background, which I cannot yet see, and that he will watch over us. There are lovely YouTube videos online for 10 to 15 minute meditations, which I prefer. When you first begin, your goal is to calm your mind. Just be. Instead of always running and doing, calm your body and mind. Learn to relax. I also want to talk about exercise. Now I know, I know. You're probably saying, did she have to bring up that word? Yes, I did. (laughs) The reason is not so much to worry about your physical size, although that is a wonderful byproduct, but rather to get you moving which will help reduce the possibility of depression. When we sit too long and continually reflect upon our pain instead of doing something with our body, we can easily fall into a depressed state. And I don't want this to happen to you. Making special time for exercise, especially when you're dealing with such pain, is so valuable. Even though you feel like you want to lie in bed all day, 
It is important that you move, get outside, and get some fresh air. If all you do is walk outside your door and breathe in the air, or walk a block down the street and back, it is far better than had you stayed in bed all day. In the beginning, this may be significant for you. The whole purpose is to get your body moving. If you will do this for me every day, within a few weeks, you'll feel stronger and walk longer and farther. Maybe now it will be three blocks, then four, and before you know it, you'll be able to walk a mile. You'll start to look forward to this. It will be your time for yourself. And while you are grieving, you really need that. There are also YouTube videos on High Impact Interval Training, or SIT, Short Interval Training, which are intense, fast workouts for very short periods of time. Perhaps you would feel like that is even better for you. Also, when you wake up in the morning, lift all the blinds and draw the curtains to bring in the light. This sounds like such a little thing, but when you feel blue, you tend to want to shut out the world. And when you open them, the sunlight will come in and it will help lift your mood as well. And if it is a darker, drearier day, at least the light will come in, much better than having a dull, dark room to depress you more. I want you to also recognize and acknowledge all the feelings that you are experiencing right now. The more we try to restrict and deny what is really happening in our emotions, the more stress we build. And the whole point is to try to reduce unnecessary stress. We had plenty to deal with before our loved one died. Now we are coupled with even more. I also encourage you to plan a nutritious diet. It is very easy to become the junk food queen or king when you have limited energy to cook and prepare meals. Junk food will not serve your body well, especially now. You need to build your strength through good food. Try to be conscious of what you are eating. Because we feel so bad, we don't worry about what is going into our mouths. We just pick up anything. When our immune system is already broken down, it is even more of a challenge. We need to consider our diet, build ourselves up, and stay in a healthy mode. Consider reducing or eliminating sugar, white flour, wheat, and caffeine, which is found in coffee, chocolate, teas, and sodas. Stay away from processed foods as much as possible. My rule is, if I can't pronounce the ingredients, it shouldn't go in my body. Use dairy products sparingly and only organic. Reduce your intake of breads, pastas, grains, and other carbohydrates. Choose chicken and turkey. Eat abundant amounts of salad and vegetables. Minimal amounts of fruit, which produce so much sugar. When you do not eat well, it takes your body extra energy to digest these foods, which gives you less of the energy you need to heal. Eat foods that will support your body and mind. Now, some people think vitamins and supplements are useless, and even some doctors, who are afraid their services won't be needed by healthy, informed consumers, will tell you vitamins and supplements are unnecessary. I strongly disagree. We need to do everything in our power, especially with the high cost of health care, to support our bodies. When our loved one dies, our physical bodies react to the strain and can decrease the strength of our immune system. During less stressful times, we had already built up toxins in our system from the pollutants in the air, pesticides used to preserve food, and through antibiotics from medication. 
compound a perhaps weakened immune system with the stress of a loved one's death, and we can be that much more susceptible to illness. Enlist the help of a holistic or homeopathic doctor and nutritionist who will assist you in caring for your entire or whole body. Their skill at helping you build a strong immune system will be worth any cost insurance may not pay for. I'd also like you to listen to comforting and soothing music each day. Pick out a good radio station or channel in classical, jazz, spiritual, or other soothing genres. Choosing tunes which have rhythms of the ocean or other equally wonderful sounds of nature can be so comforting. You want to develop a peace-filled environment. You may find that instrumental is less risky than songs with words. But, ultimately, you will hear that one perfect song, your song, or some sentimental song, which will only bring you sadness, start the tears to flow, and bring you on an unsettling trip down memory lane. While you may find soothing is good right now, don't dismiss the need to play loud, fun music where you can dance and feel joyful once again, like I encourage you at the end of each episode here. And I know you must have thought I was really weird for doing this the first time you joined me, but it was and is intentional. When you can handle it, uplifting music is far superior to slow, memory-filled music. You will find there is a place for both, but please don't be a slave to either format. There will actually be times when that soft, memory-filled music will help you cry out your pain and release many pent-up emotions, which you may not have otherwise been able to release. And even though this process can be painful and exhausting, wise individuals know it is far healthier to go through the pain, experiencing all its facets, than to mask it as if nothing has happened. I'd also like you to balance work and play. If we work or play too hard, neither will support us. Men, in particular, tend to overdo work because it keeps them from coming home to the reality that their loved one is no longer there and perhaps push aside their feelings and pain. It's very easy to fool yourself when you are at work. You keep yourself busy and somehow you feel stronger in that chaotic state. But intentionally staying busy by developing more and more work for yourself only puts your feelings of grief on hold that much longer. Eventually, you will have to deal with this pain. Better to understand that facing the pain will ultimately support your work life better. It will help keep you in balance. It is easier to deal with significant pain little by little than all at once when down the road you crash. Take the necessary time now. Don't be embarrassed to ask for time off. There are many ways to get more time for yourself. Perhaps leaving early each day, taking half days on Friday, Hiring out someone to do the lawn and other household chores so you can spend more time together with your family on the weekends. Use your creativity. Remember, you can never replace this time with your family. They need for you to physically be around them when crisis occurs. Showing up four months from now will not help. They need you now. Find the courage to develop balance and set your priorities. Jobs are just one part of your entire life. You can get another job, but this is the only life you have. Also, if it is helpful, visit the cemetery or speak to their photo. Write a letter to them sharing all you are going through and how much you miss them a love note of sorts. Most times, I'd write that in my gratitude journal, but occasionally, I'd write it on stationery or a note card and bury it at the cemetery.
Now I know that might sound weird, but it gave me solace. In the past, I've taken a blanket, lunch, and visited my grandmother just to be closer to her. It might sound silly to some, but it worked for me. I lie down on the blanket and just spend time there. I talk to her and catch her up on my life without her in it. Sometimes I'd cry, sometimes not. But she was such a big part of my life for most of it, and I miss her to this day. She died in 1995 when I was finishing up work on my first directory, my first book. It was called the National Directory of Bereavement Support Groups and Services. And it also won some beautiful awards. I remember I was working with the graphic designer then, and I would always pray that when she died, I would be with her. Well, I was living in New York back then and came to Florida to have concentrated time with the graphic designer of my choice. We'd lay out groups of pages at night, and in the day, I'd proofread. On Tuesday night, I went over to see her with the dedication page that I created honoring her. In typical selfless fashion, when I showed it to her, she said, Now, Mary, why'd you go and do that? (laughs) I was so grateful I went to show her that particular night because on Friday, she took a turn for the worst, was admitted into the hospital, and exactly a week later, on the next Tuesday, at about the same time, 7.30 at night, I was there holding her hand when she died. I am forever grateful that God granted me my wish. I got to be with her at the end, and I got to tell her how much I loved her, even though she knew it. It's very important that you do what you need to do for yourself when you're going through the grieving process. Some may think it's strange, but what do you care? Do it anyway. It soothes you, comforts you, helps you to move forward. Don't build up more stress by trying to please someone else who thinks your actions are not appropriate. Forget what they say. You need to relieve stress. And lastly, I want you to develop your sense of humor again. Many who are grieving develop the misunderstanding that they are not allowed to feel happiness again because their loved one is not here to feel happiness with them. I've been asked, How can I possibly feel happy again when my loved one is in the ground? We feel we don't have that right. But I'm here to tell you, you do have a right to feel happy again. It may not come consistently in the beginning, but little at a time you will feel it. And don't feel badly that you enjoyed the laughter, jokes, feelings you used to have before they died. It's perfectly okay. Enjoy those happy spurts. You need them. You may even catch yourself laughing one day and look around wondering if anyone saw you. You may think, how can I be laughing? This isn't right. But each one of us in our own timing will release these feelings of guilt when we acknowledge that our loved one wouldn't want us to go around somber the rest of our lives. They'd want us to live our life, even without them. And slowly, as you settle this within yourself, you give yourself permission to feel happiness again. So, let's add to our happiness right now. Let's get up and move our bodies, dance, swing our arms, and feel the music.
you for being with me today. Remember to write five things each night in your journal that you are grateful for. Subscribe, rate, and review my podcast wherever you listen to me. And please consider buying me a coffee if you'd like to support my work. You can visit my sites www.marymac.info or themarymacshow.com and you'll find the cute little cup on the lower left-hand corner. And that would mean so much to me. And as always, remember to be happy because you deserve to. I'll speak with you again soon.